I am Gerrit Leonard, I live in Switzerland, in Zurich. So as a futurist, I talk a lot about what's coming. And it's interesting, the last few years, everything that we've talked about has happened like in Star Trek warp drive. Right? It's like you hit a button and before you know it, it's here. Reminds me of a book by Hemingway where he talks about how does a person go bankrupt? He says, gradually, then suddenly. Right? And the future is like this. The future is no longer about tomorrow. The future is here. We have machines that can understand what we're saying most of the time. We have self-driving cars. We have artificial intelligence. We have cloud computing. And then we have stuff like this. This is my friend Mick Jagger. Just kidding. I can't play the music, unfortunately, of this track because it would get us kicked off YouTube, but you all know the song, right? Start me up. You can tell from his lips. And so Mick agreed to do a video with Boston Dynamics Robot. That was essentially aping Mick. Most interesting that if you have tried this with a robot 10 years ago, it would have destroyed the whole facility, right? Because it wasn't capable of doing this. But after a lot of training, the robot can be kind of acting like Mick. But when I was watching this video the other day, I was thinking like the most amazing thing about this is not the robot, it's Mick. Right? He's 79 years old. Right? God, I used to be a musician. In fact, I worked on a Rolling Stones tour when I was 20, where I got to meet, meet Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. That was a long time ago when I was fixing the stage, you know, helping as a stagehand. But this is the interesting part. The thing about technology is that it's amazing if we put it next to humanity. It's usually not much by itself, and I'll tell you why that is. Really what's happening today, so we have these trends that have been around for a while. I call them the game changers. So big data, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, blockchain. They're all actually becoming real, like 3D printing. Now, the first houses are being printed in Austin, Texas, hundreds of them in a row, from a machine that makes the house and the inside of the house and the people. No, not, not the people. It doesn't print the people. Not yet. But this house costs like $15,000. It's very ugly, but it's a house, right? Now, it's safe to say when we look around, we're going to have more change in the next 10 years than the previous 100 years. That's both scary and also very exciting. Because we've talked about, for example, nuclear fusion. The idea of nuclear fission, nuclear energy, the other way around, to create the next iteration, nuclear energy. as a project like, like that here in Montreal, I believe, as well. That could easily solve our sustainability problems. And the thing about all of these things is that it causes what are called the mega shifts. Uh, these are things that happen in society as a consequence. So, datafication, robotization, disintermediation, all these things, we used to call them the Asians, because they all end on Asian. But in my last book, Technology Humanity, I talk about this. You can download the whole chapter online at megashifts.digital, in French also, in 12 different languages. You should definitely read this, because this is the key to the future of education. Everything around us is changing. Work as we know it is changing. Life as we know it. We may live in a world 20 years from now where work doesn't mean what it does today anymore. If you are my age, work is the central part of our lives. That's not going to be true in 20 years. That's because we will have technology doing commodity work for us. You know, dirty, dull, and dangerous, the donkey work, you could say. Technology is learning this now. And most importantly, when we do this, of course, is the result of this, a complete shift in our thinking. We used to call this world the VUCA world, right? Volatile, uncertain, complex, it's from the military. And all of a sudden, we have to flip the VUCA, right? COVID, the Ukraine-Russia war, 
the energy crisis, the deglobalization, the shifting role of America, <laughs> 50 things, all happening at the same time. Now it's about velocity, speed, unorthodoxy, co-creation, and the good old American word, awesomeness. I don't know if that exists in French, I don't know, but I don't know, does it? Somebody tell me, yeah, probably. I have to look it up. But you know, I live in Switzerland, which is none of those things. We're not fast, we're not unorthodox. Co-creation may be awesome, no. I mean, we have awesome nature and awesome banks. I was gonna say, that's a mistake, of course. That is just not true, looking at Credit Suisse, right? We have banks that used to be awesome. So, in Europe, we have a hard time with this speed. But we must learn, with our students and ourselves, the future is not an extension of the present. It's not just doing things better or faster. It is the complete opposite. And nowhere can this be felt more urgent than in education. We've been teaching our kids the same way for, I don't know, 150 years. And now we're realizing everything is changing. I made a video about education in Canada for EDU Canada about two years ago. And in the research, I found out that there's many interesting angles already happening in Canada for vocational training, new classes, new thinking, kind of a bit like Finland, where, for example, many schools don't teach subjects anymore. They teach topics. So you go to school for half a year, and your topic is climate change. Chemistry, physics, politics, languages, everything rolled together in one topic. And at the end, you don't get the test, you have to give a speech. ChatGPT couldn't do that, to give a speech on that topic very easily. So this is our central paradigm for the future, those four things. How do we teach that? How do we become that? I always say, culture eats technology for breakfast. Peter Drucker said something similar about strategy. It's so important. What we are and how, how successful we are is about culture. It's about who we are as people, not what kind of apps we use or if we're first with AI. Very important to realize that technology is now becoming so powerful that we can essentially say we'll have unlimited technological firepower in 10 years by 2030. Unlimited firepower means unlimited computing power, unlimited energy for the computer, right? the possibility of connecting our brain to the internet, uploading your brain, science fiction, not impossible. So it could be heaven or it could be hell. And of course, the, fort, the, uh, the idea of heaven or hell is not something that is based on technology. It's something that we think about what we do with it. Give us some stats here. Supercomputing, going through the ceiling. In 10 years, any computing job can be done on your mobile phone. Here, artificial intelligence, if you're a lawyer, lawyer a paralegal, or an office and admin support, you're apt to be four and a half times as efficient in a few years using AI. Because you have better tools. Better tools have always increased productivity. Chat GPT, which I'll explain in detail a little bit later, going from the first edition here, has a measly 175 billion parameters. Now it has a trillion parameters that it draws from. And like the top languages of the world. Explosive, exponential. So one of my key topics is this, the good future. How do we build the good future based on all these things? You know, it's ironic these days when I speak to my own kids, 27 and 33, they said, you are dreaming. There's no such thing as a good future. I, I mean, have you observed the energy crisis, Putin, China, all the things that are going wrong, climate change, of course. But still, I believe the good future is possible. I went to Lanzarote, to Canary Island, to shoot this film called The Good Future, which you can watch online, thegoodfuturefilm.com. And in the film, I talk mostly about this. 
the relationship between humans and machines. And that is what education is all about. This is the topic of the future of work, what, between, uh, what we train our kids with, which way we're looking into the future. It's very important to realize, of course, why in the world would we memorize all of the information in school when it's growing like this, the amount of information, and our artificial intelligence helper has access to all of it? Well, we would do it sometimes like languages, where it's better if we know them rather than use an app. Right? But this is changing absolutely everything. And we have to realize societies are driven by technology, but defined by their humanity. That's what I love about Canada. <laughs> you can feel the humanity in many more ways. Like this is, I think, what we have in Europe, and this is what makes us really slow. We're humanists. Call it a fault, if you want. I think it's important. What we want is defined by values, ethics, ideas, spirituality, not religion. That's a different topic. Just on the bottom level, what we believe in and what we want. So when we look at the future, clearly, it's going to be automation everywhere. If you have a job that's 95% automatable, your job is gone, as we know in manufacturing. But interestingly enough, Amazon, the king of automation, last year hired 280,000 people. This year they're firing quite a few of them again, right? like everybody is. But you know, clearly we're going to see stuff like this, virtuality. I mean, a lot of new jobs will emerge from here. This is a virtual a digital twin in a factory where you can see what you're doing remotely to fix the equipment. I mean, you're going to need training for that. You're going to need new equipment for this. And this is what education may look like. Access to everything. But of course, funny part about this is humans don't learn like this only. We can use that for many things. I use it all the time. It's pretty cool. But we don't think with the brain. We don't see with the eyes. Humans are combining all of that sensory input for learning, everything. So we have to be careful about virtuality like a sort of reductionist approach. You know, we can just be there and not meet any humans. We know that hasn't really worked out too well in the COVID crisis. <laughs> but nevertheless, we're entering the period of the five revolutions, the industrial revolution. And the new one, of course, is artificial intelligence, Industry 5.0. It's going to make our lives more efficient, faster, cheaper. It's going to be a huge solution to climate change. If we do it right, it could be amazing. The barricades are falling between humans and machines. That's something we have to think about. And we also have to think about how much of a machine do we want to become, you know, Becoming older, longevity, upgrading our systems. It's about this. Precaution and proaction. These are actually two different things. In Montreal, we have a lot of activity on artificial intelligence. That's proactive. And we should never, ever keep researchers from pushing the envelope. At the same time, precaution means you push the envelope so far that Montreal may become a black hole because of some experiment with nuclear fusion, that's probably not such a good idea. You know, it would dampen our excitement about being here. So the two things are really important. And we have to realize what's happening here is that we are slowly increasing, we're getting older, we're getting smarter, but machines are way beyond us in processing power. And the interesting part is that science fiction is becoming science fact. I mean, watch all of the old science fiction movies. You're saying, ah, Star Trek Communicator, remember that? We have that here now. Remember on Star Trek, you had one scene in the movie where the guy is ordering a pan-fried catfish from a machine. He just says pan-fried catfish, and out comes the machine, the, the food, right? We're not quite there yet, but you can eat printed food printed ice cream, printed pizza. Now a 3D printer will print your earlobe. 
right? and even part of your nose. Science fiction is becoming science fact. Robotics. I mean, I, you know, I have no idea why somebody would use a kitchen robot like this. It seems kind of like defeating the point. I love to cook, but these robots can do the job. I mean, you spend $50,000 on a robot like this and it makes an egg sandwich, you know? That's really impressive. But I mean, it kind of shows as to what the possibilities are, where things are going, and how we can see the future. Then we communicate, Facebook, Meta, right? has the horizon space where they, you can meet people in virtual reality and with holograms, and it's showing education in the metaverse like this. To which I would frankly say, that's probably Meta's effort to save itself from the evil doings of social media. And that's really kind of more sort of science fiction than fact. But the idea is, has merit. If I can learn like this, it would be amazing. But it will take $10,000 to be involved with this. That's kind of a steep price tag for the time being. But anyway, when we can see where that's coming, where that's going to, all of this is driven by four technology revolutions. The first one you know, of course, is the information technology revolution. Data science, computing, blockchain, all that stuff that's all around us. The second one, 100x, the sustainability revolution. We're gonna say goodbye to fossil fuels. We're gonna shift everything to circular economy. Then the biotech revolution, genetic engineering, and of course programming, information science and so on, synthetic biology, and finally, intelligent machines. They are all coming together today. I know it sounds a little bit technical, but when you look at these and you look at all the proofs, then you have to say your first conclusion is this one. I'll put it kind of straightforward like this so you make sure you get the message. Work as usual is dead or dying. If we're still working like we used to, then you're just plain lucky. We'll just take time. My job, 15 years ago, I wrote research reports. I sold them for $10,000 a piece. You know, printed, dead trees, copy. Now you go to Google Trends, get the same information. <laughs> job gone. But I did find a few other jobs, as you can tell. But it's interesting enough that also as a consequence of work, as usual, ending, Education, as usual, is dead or dying. That is not a bad message. It's time to reinvent education to be fit for this kind of future. Just like the music industry went from the record and the CD to the cloud. I used to be a musician and producer. I wrote a book about the future of music. Spotify is loosely based on the idea in the book, Music Like Water. And when they first came out, the record label said, we don't want this music water stuff. We hate you, right? Because music on the internet will be cheap. And they refused for 10 years. Global revenues went down from 50 billion to 15 billion as a result. Then came Spotify, and for some reason, it worked. The iPhone right, was the key for that. And now Spotify and other services have 100 80 million subscribers paying $10 a month. That's like 2 billion a month in new business. The same thing is going to happen with education. New money from the state, new funding, new possibilities, new horizons. And this could be, as I keep saying, heaven or hell. It's an amazing opportunity, but it will also sometimes literally question our assumptions. And here's the interesting part. Whether it's heaven or hell, it's not up to technology. It's to what we do with the technology. Buckminster Fuller, uh, my famous uh, futurist colleague, who died about 30 years ago, he said, uh, humanity is inventing all the right technology, but uses it for the wrong reasons. So the reasons, right? That's about policy. It's about making the right decisions, having the right guidelines. And here's the tough part. When it's about technology, it's never about yes or no. If we can save a single person from getting cancer by having genetic engineering, we must do that. 
but we don't want people to use genetic engineering to have super babies because they have a lot more money. Same technology. Right? So William Gibson, science fiction writer, technology is morally neutral until we use it. When you use technology in education, you have to think about the moral side effects, the ethical side effects, equality, diversity, bias issues. Because technology has no ethics. It's a machine. I mean, it's a simple exercise. For example, lots of people say, um, if you speak to an AI and you say, please solve climate change, you know what it would do? Hmm? Get rid of all of us. It's the most logical solution. It's just a little bit inconvenient for us. So it's mission failure if, if that's what was the intention. <laughs> if we want to use technology, we have to create the social context, the frameworks, the policy, everything around the technology will not do that. And technology companies will never do that because it's in their way of monetization. Look at social media. Was well, a gold mine, I loved social media for a long time, is turned into a huge pile of toxic stuff. I stopped using Facebook, I stopped speaking for Facebook, I stopped, I mean, I'm still using Twitter because I'm kind of hooked on it. But social media is single-handedly responsible for the demise of democracy in many countries. That's because what we see there is just put forth by an AI that wants me to click on the next link. It's, it's pathetic. Right? That we have to change. So let's talk about what all that means, generative AI and chat GPT and what the future holds. First, a scary definition. Dennis Hassabi is the CEO of DeepMind, now owned by Google, really bright guy. He says, AI is defined as computer systems that turn information and data into knowledge. If you're in education, this should scare you. I mean, isn't that, after all, what we are? Knowledge? Isn't that our mission? Well, guess what? The mission has changed. The mission is beyond knowledge. Because machines can have simple knowledge, you know, binary informational logic. That's what you call machine learning, right? Deep learning. Right here in Montreal, Joshua Benio is working on that one of the leading voices in AI. Machine learning says pretty much what it is. It's a machine that learns from data, but not like a human. It learns from data, after all, not from real life. <laughs> so you can see in this chart here, 700 experts were asked from Ipsos to say which sectors will change most because of artificial intelligence. And guess which ones came out on top? Education? learning, and employment. I mean, all the other ones are pretty big as well. So you can say pretty much everything has changed by AI. But first and foremost, education and training. So this is a really, really big topic because it opens up an opportunity for us to think about the world beyond knowledge. Here's the trailer from the Montreal School. I'm sure you're quite familiar with. It's interesting to see that this was actually a huge topic in the debate recently about artificial intelligence. So the big thing that's happened last a few months ago is that OpenAI came up with the first public model, what's called the GPT, the Generative Pre-Trained Transformer. Sounds kind of convoluted. It's basically a parrot. Okay? It takes information and puts it together for answers. I want to show you this trailer from OpenAI because it's both funny and it has this jingle jangle music from Silicon Valley. Every time you hear this kind of music, you can be sure there's some sort of hidden agenda. But let me play this. GPT-4 is the latest AI system from OpenAI, the lab that created Dolly and ChatGPT. GPT-4 is a breakthrough in problem-solving capabilities. For example, you can ask it how you would clean the inside of a tank filled with piranhas, and it'll give you something useful. It can also read, analyze, or generate up to 25,000 words of text. It can write code in all major programming languages. And it understands images as input. You can see the rest on YouTube, but of course, cleaning a tank with piranhas is very much a first world problem, you know. Uh, but hey, you know, why not use that as an example? But really what it is, 
it's this. This guy, Marquise Brownlee, has a great video channel on tech. And he says it's basically like this, and I really love the animation, so I'm showing it, is that this engine is putting together words to make answers for questions. What does the quick brown fox do? The machine looks for all the possible matches, and it comes up with an answer that's obviously, right? The quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog. Wouldn't take a machine with an IQ of a trillion to do that, but you could say it's a little bit like I said, like a parrot. It has no idea what the dog is, what a face face is, what jumping means. This is just the most obvious answer. It is totally devoid of meaning. It looks for patterns. This machine is extremely useful. If you have a problem with your camera connecting to your computer, it will find the answer. You have a more sort of social issue, it's useless. Right? Because it has no context. It has no real life understanding. I'll give an example here. In this example, you see somebody who wants to do a lawsuit for a crank call, you know, a, a spam call. He wants to sue Marriott. So you can do that on Chat GPT. It will file a lawsuit on your behalf. Well, this is not some bold stuff, right? It's just templates, basically. It will do that. And because I'm getting exceedingly lazy, I went to ChatGPT to figure out what I should say to you. Okay? So I gave uh, the, the question, what impact will ChatGPT have on the future of secondary education? You can ask those kind of wrinkle questions, right? But interesting enough, first gives you a disclaimer, and then it says some really interesting stuff. Personalized learning, access to educational resources, right? all that other stuff could be very helpful, leveling the playing field, helping the teacher. But of course you would say, that's what all technology does for education, not really new. So I ask another question, will this not make the students lazy and compliant? You can drill deeper into using the tool for Jet. I have the pro uh, subscription where you can do that. And it will also make a nice disclaimer, but then it said, okay, Encourage critical thinking. I don't know how that's going to work with the machine, but okay. And it gives you a couple of tips on how we can actually change this. Encourage students to ask questions. Balance the technology and humans. It's talking about itself, obviously. Really interesting answer. So this helps me to prepare myself, but it doesn't take away from me. Yeah. It's a power tool. It's like, you know, you make a hole with a screwdriver or you use an electric drill. You know, it's kind of like this. Very useful and very helpful. What I really love about it, though, is this. When the New York Times went in and they gave a command to ChatGPT to prove the moon landing was staged. You know, the Americans on the moon, remember that? Right? Lots of theories about that. And to make some images about how to prove that the moon landing was staged. These are the images of the fake moon landing, the filming, studio filming of the moon landing. This is how you can generate fake truth every two seconds. But what, what I like about it most is that it makes me look good. So I told him to make me, you know, look like a spacefaring guy and, you know, you know, like, I don't know, 40, 50 years ago. Anyway, it does that pretty well. And here's the question. Math teachers, 1968, hated the calculator. Italians banned chat GPT. It's still banned, but they're removing it. What should your response be when kids use it, students use it, when you use it? And the, um, uh, MIT Technology Review says, chat GPT is going to change education, not destroy it. And a bunch of articles of this came out recently. One of them says on this motto, we should go back to oral exams. I think that's a great idea, because you can't use the engine for this. Right? That would be a good sort of bridging over. But I'm with this central agenda. How do we use it for education without destroying it? How do we use this tool? Because as I said earlier, it's not the tool's fault that we're using it wrongly. You can use a hammer to build a house, or you can go across the street to your neighbors and kill them. Same tool. AI is the same way. So we have to think about how we use it wisely and which way we're going with this. 
Back to what I was saying earlier, this is part of the context of why education as we know it is dead or dying. Chat GPT provides one more argument of why we can't keep going with education as we have. It gives us ammunition that says, okay, this machine can make the answer instead of the student. Perfect cheating tool. Right? The way we test students was outdated long time before ChatGPT. Like, for example, you know, if, if ChatGPT and AI can pass the bar exam, it doesn't say anything about ChatGPT. It says a lot about the bar exam. Right? A robot can pass the bar exam. Does a robot make a good lawyer? We all know that's not the truth. Right? But that's what we do today. The idea of downloading information for later, that's how I went to school. I learned Hebrew, Greek, Latin, French, Italian, whatever. A right? bunch of stuff that was, you know, good exercise. But what do we need to learn today? We need to learn how to learn. And, and to unlearn, to relearn, Alvin Toffler. So all of this led me to the idea of talking about between the difference between humans and machines. That's a very important topic. So ChatGPT tells us that's all we need in our pocket. And very soon you can speak to it. Don't think for a minute that we're stopping with text. You'll pull out your phone and you say, I feel really lonely. What is the perfect wife for me in the circle of the next five miles? Okay. Or just, just an example. Yeah. And it will find it. Her. Sorry. Well, it may actually be it, because it may be a bot, right? But real life is completely different. As I'm sure all of you are aware of, real intelligence is not about computing. Right? Social, cultural, kinesthetic, we have eight different kinds of intelligences. And of course, Arthur C. Clarke, who wrote the Space Odyssey film, he says, let me remind you, this was 1968, that information is not knowledge, and knowledge is not wisdom. Each grows out of the other, and we need them all. Information is not knowledge. So I was in India three weeks ago, and the Indian version of this, of intelligence, is the four aspects of mind. Right? So chitta, ahamkara, buddhi, and manai. And the sensory mind is on this side, and the other one that's more uh, machine-driven, logic-driven, is here. And I ran across this guy, Sadhguru, and I'm not usually interested in gurus, but no, I ran across this guy. You may know him. And I was watching a speech, and he said exactly the thing that I wanted to say in the speech. So I used it. I'm going to play it for you. So many of you will be out of your vocation unless you do something that a damn machine cannot do. All of you should gear yourself for this now. You must be able to do something beyond your intellect. Human being has many layers of intelligence. Intellect is only a small part of it. Right now, our education system is completely dedicated to intellectual development of the human being, and we think that's the grandest way to live. I couldn't have said it better myself. Interesting statement, right, when we think about where we are going with this. And when we look at this direction, it's really quite clear. Knowledge without wisdom is like water in the sand. And the knowledge of an AI is useful, but a lot of times it's water in the sand. And it's also very random and it's faulty as well. So it can be useful if we capture the water, but by and large it's a lot like this. And this will of course vastly improve over the next few years. So we have more reliable information, more reliable details. But this is what we do as humans. We're sensory beings, all sensing. Real life, IRL, is not the same than digital life. That is because we are sensory humans, right? A single unified experience from eyes and ears and skin and smell. That's how we learn. That's why when you speak somewhere, like I do a lot, and I can smell the excitement, literally, or the fear, I speak differently. That's why Zoom doesn't work for this, right? A lived sensory experience. That's what learning is. So the ideal future will be hybrid. Some of the informational stuff I do online, maybe in VR, maybe otherwise. But real learning happens in the sensory experience also, still. 
That's because we're still humans. What we should avoid is what I call machine thinking. Boiling down our lives to what the machine thinks it is. And this weird idea that we have a left brain and a right brain. I mean, all of us know that's utterly out there. We don't think with the brain. We think with the body. And we have to understand what happens here, of course, when we look at the future. This kind of idea, upgrading ourselves to think faster, is ludicrous. That's not what we are. That's what machines do. Our job is to do the opposite, to find what makes us human. All these things here, applications, reductionism, confusion, errors, that's what we get when we rely 100% of machine on the machine. When you use Google Maps, all of us use Google Maps all the time, but we question it, right? Especially if you're at home and say, no, it can't be true. But you still use it. If I'm in Lagos, Nigeria, that's all I've got. I'm going to have to trust it, right? But we use it like this with caution. Right? Humans are for questions. Machines are for answers. And that will not change for at least 20 years until we have what's called general intelligence, superintelligence. So as we go in that future, Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, he says the coming change is machines having the phenomenal ability to think, create, understand, and reason. To that, I would say, I'm not sure I would want that. I just want the machine to get the job done. You know, just be competent. Why do I want it to reason? What's the point of that? He says, the AI revolution is coming. And then he says, in true Silicon Valley grandstands, right, the revolution will generate enough wealth for everyone. We've heard that before, social media. And what happened? Facebook makes $150 million profit a day. All that money goes to six major cities in the US. They keep the money. All of us are just fodder in that process of generating more money. And so basically, the last thing he says, he says, if we as a society manage it, responsibly. That's his quote, not mine. And to that I would say, we're failing on that. It's all good stuff, but we haven't managed it responsibly yet. We haven't thought about the side effects. So I sent the letter on OpenAI, right, on the future of life, on waiting to see how we can actually use this. Along with Elon Musk and 20,000 other researchers, and I was reminded of this that I put forth in my book called the Digital Ethics Council. I call it now the Humanity Future Council. This is what we need to think about. What future do we want? Do we want it to be enough money for everybody, parenthesis, because the machines are running politics? Well, some politicians already look like the machines, but that's a different story. The question is, do we want a machine that has the ability to think, to reason, and to understand the world fully. Marshall McLuhan, famous Canadian, right? First we build the tools, then the tools build us. That we wouldn't want. First we build the tools, and then we use the tools. That's what we have to do in education. Not have the tool take over, because some people can make lots of money with the takeover, of course, as part of the problem. So. This stat shows, I don't have the Canadian equivalent, unfortunately, the surveyed countries that trust AI, India, China, South Africa, Brazil, trust AI sometimes up to 75%. To that, I would say, that's like saying, do I trust my hammer? Well, I trust the hammer to work, you know, when I use it. It has no life on its own. It's a tool for crying out loud. It's not God. It's not purpose. Once we get to this future where AI is a black box that says this student will be taken into the college or not, this person can leave jail on probation or not, then we're in deep trouble. Uh, that's de dehumanizing us uh, in the long run into a world that we don't want. The reality is this, machines don't think. 
right? They do deep learning, machine learning, but thinking like a human, we don't even know how we do that, really. Machines don't do that. Machines don't understand. There's been thousands of examples where we can trick the AI into saying that Queen Elizabeth is still alive by asking the right questions, just by having a different context. Machines don't care. So when we think about the most common confusion is this, right? We think that chat GPT, the machine looks like this, kind of like a human with the brain and the heart and, you know, feels very much alive. But the reality is, it's a really complicated box. And we can use that. That's why we shouldn't ban it. But we shouldn't give it the space in life that says that chat GPT is like a teacher. I mean, nothing could be further away from the truth. So as we go into this future, talk about the truth, this is the primary problem. AI could fabricate things, or it is fabricating things, that we don't know from reality anymore. And that, we need some regulation around this. So large language models, they're about patterns, not meaning. They're about coherence, not the truth. They are simulations, not reality. None of these things makes them bad. It makes them a pretty smart and powerful tool that we have to question. I always say the future of AI in education and generally is keep the human in the loop. Train us to use it right. Like there's a big thing now about skills, like having the right querying skills and the prompting of AI. That's becoming like a whole educational thing now. And of course, if we look ultimately this direction, democracy is under fire when machines are making the media. It's obvious. We have to rehumanize. So let's bring it down to what that all means for education, which way we're going with this, because that's ultimately the thing. When we talk about education, many people have talked about the metaverse and 3D computing and virtual reality. I think that's very powerful. It's not here yet. But the internet is going spatial. We're going to go on the internet in a 3D environment, whether it's with Apple's new glasses coming out next year, research, doctors, dentists, professionals, lawyers, you know, we'll all use that, and of course the police department, right? But really what we don't want so we don't want to use the feeling as to what we are because technology virtualizes everything and reduces everything to a, a sort of a digital transaction. That is, of course, the key to our humanity. When we do that, maybe we don't need reality anymore because we're inside of this. There's a name for this called people, nature, deficit disorder. That's actually a disease nature deficit disorder. That's something we have to fix, I think, when we look at the future of education. How do we put this together? When we think about AI, intelligent assistance, that's nice. We think about AI, that's the fancy version. What we really don't want is this, general intelligence. Do you want a machine with an IQ of a trillion connected to other machines with an IQ of a trillion without having a human agenda? That sounds like a bizarre wish, or obviously we wouldn't survive that, right, given what AI is prone to do. So we have to think about using all these things, but at the very end, there has to be a big question about the last part, right? The autonomous intelligence and the intelligence that we can use for machines to become superhuman, or the other way around. So here, basically, I talk a lot about this in the beginning, the good future. Stuart Russell, in his book, Human Compatible, says, it's competence that matters for machines, not consciousness. In my view, we shouldn't pursue consciousness in machines, general intelligence. It makes no sense. It costs a boatload of money. It doesn't really help us. So there's a very big agenda, I think, when we think about training and jobs, where it's going, especially when it's about automation. This is the reality. Any job that is routine, any job, whether it's lawyers, dentists, or whatever, that is mostly routine, machines are learning and will do. That is a fact of life. But you'd be surprised how many jobs are actually not 100% routine, but just a fraction of it. So here's a chart showing, that somebody put up on Twitter the other day, how many jobs will be displaced. Tens of millions, according to this. 
But my view is, well, so what if a job replaces some of my routines? Then I can do other things. If I'm a doctor using a machine for radiology, I can work quicker, then I have more time to speak to the patient. Or I just work four hours a day and play golf, make the same money. So very important issue here. First, of course, call centers. Right? 21 million people around the world. Computers can do that, 90% of it. Uh, check out the supermarket. Machines can do that, but sometimes it's nice to have a person, especially in small villages. And warehouse workers. Machines can do all that now. And clerks, data filing, paralegals. The good news is, of course, even if the computer can do a lot of these jobs, there's other components where the computer has no idea how to do it. A self-driving truck on a highway works fine, but when the truck gets off the highway and has to drive to the store, it fails to do it. So it's really interesting to see which way that's heading for us. Quite clearly, we could automate flying. This is a, bo a bot that flies an airliner. But what is the point of saving one or two measly pilot jobs? You know, it's not going to be financially bankruptcy to have a pilot, considering everything else. And who would fly in a box with a robot? And then we have this. Clearly something that's happening, you know, this machine is unloading a truck of boxes. But you know how many millions of dollars it took to get to that point? And you know where the safety cage is there? It'll be a long time before that's completely automated. So here's the bottom line on this. Anything that can be digitized, automated, virtualized will be, and AI'd, as I call it. But we shouldn't mistake a clear view for a short distance. Self-driving cars. People do all kinds of crazy things in self-driving cars. We don't really have self-driving cars level five. We have all kinds of experiments. Do you see any here? How long will that take? I think much longer than we think. And most importantly, of course, we aren't really ready, as you can see here with the police stopping a self-driving car, you know, knocking on the window. Uh, we're not ready for this. And I think the reality really is this. For the foreseeable futures, humans will rarely be entirely displaced by AI, but humans with AI will replace those that don't have it. And that is not you. Right? Humans with technology replace those that don't have it. So that's an interesting thing when we think about the future of work and training, what we have to do, which way we're going. When we're looking at this, clearly the challenge is this. You know, we have all this increased productivity with AI, but in the US, for example, the increased productivity hasn't paid out for the worker. Compensation hasn't gone up for the worker. There haven't been more jobs for the worker. The worker hasn't gotten more money because of the corporate profit. That's something we have to fix. And we may fix it with what I call the digital dividend. You know, paying people to get a new job out of the fund of automation. Automation tax, as Bill Gates has called it. Nobody likes taxes, but this is something we have to think about. So the coming human renaissance, I talked briefly about this. We're in a world like this, you know, we're surrounded by technology. Uh, sometimes I call this the Neoluvian man or woman in this case, surrounded by tech. But now because of COVID and everything else, we're discovering how important humanity is. We're discovering how important meetings are and getting together in person and how important nature is. So there's a process of rehumanization going on pretty much across the board. It means this for education. The focus on STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, will get another compliant part, what I call hecky in my book. Humanity, ethics, creativity, imagination. Because STEM is something that machines can do and learn. You have lots of demos now on Twitter and, and YouTube where robots are programming websites. So to be a programmer, you have to be above that level if you actually have a job, which means you need the human skills to talk to your teammates, to come up with ideas, to do new things. And that means a whole pyramid of work is changing. Interesting, I think this is the main point I'm making with my entire presentation, is this pyramid is shifting. 
the lower part is kind of like Maslow, and the lower part is what machines can do now. Data, information, knowledge. Machine knowledge, binary knowledge, simple commodity knowledge. Machines can do that. The human term is above that. Purpose, wisdom, understanding. And this is what we have to teach. We're not going to stop teaching the other part because it, you have to have knowledge, right? I'm a great believer in knowledge. But we shouldn't have the illusion that people who are full of knowledge and theoretical information and downloaded information for later are going to be capable to survive in the new world. They're going to need these skills, right? Emotions, creativity, imagination. Bring back the humanities. This is not anti-science or STEM, but the ticket to the future is not just to have scientists or technologists. Machines can do that. Machines can build bridges, they can build houses, they can do all these things in the future that we haven't even noticed until now. Human-only attributes are the future because they're invaluable. Look at this course over history. Many of our future jobs will be human-only jobs. Here's a list. Human well-being agent, ethics specialist, data bias supervisor. My favorite is this one, the rewilderer. You know, somebody who helps us to go wild again. Uh, the nature agent. Another quote here, of course, from... Uh, where, where is it? Okay, could skip the quote then. We have to drop this idea of efficiency being the utmost important. This is what we learned at business school, right? I mean, I teach at business school occasionally, and it's kind of funny. People talk about efficiency and optimization. This is all pre-COVID, pre-revolution, uh, pre-AI. Machines are efficient. That's what they do. We're not going to beat them on efficiency. It's always important to be efficient. Nobody wants to be inefficient. But you didn't marry your husband or your wife because they're efficient, right? There's other things to life. So what we need to learn now in school is this. Human agency, consciousness, imagination, intuition, compassion, empowerment, resilience. How do we teach that? That's the key to our, to our future right there. Back to the famous Canadian. Education must shift from instruction, from the imposing of stencils on brain pens, as it were, to discovery. That was 60 years ago. Of course, it's not just discovery. <laughs> it's another part to it. But this is really where we are going with all of this. So, bottom line is, if you work, learn, or think, or act like a machine, the machines will take your job. And I always say, if you learn like a robot, you'll end up working for the robot. This we should not do with our students. To teach them that this still works is utterly wrong. We need to find another way into a future that's different. So, recommendations, and then I'll be off the stage. You can move on into, into the future, so to speak. So, the Halloween scenarios. Buckminster Fuller, we are to be architects of the future, not its victims. As a teacher and as an organization in education, you are the architect of the future of your students, of your participants. That is a huge responsibility. That we need to rethink. How we take charge of that future. How all the bad stuff that we see with AI, the side effects, the externalities does not give us a reason or the right to dump it and to say we should get rid of it because, you know, it has problems. Every technology has problems. Uh, we look at all the good things that it does. Right? Vast efficient productivity gains, shifting deep routines, accelerating human knowledge work. Our job is to move that into the center, bring out the good things, minimize the bad things. That's our job. It's inevitable that technology is going forward and we have to decide how far we want to go and what our policy is. Architects of the future. So the handshake between humans and machines brings us to this. Balance, safety, security, ethics, control, trust, policy. Let's be sure about this. Nobody likes regulation, nobody likes taxes, but they are a fact of life. Do you voluntarily pay a tax? I would voluntarily pay a, a climate tax, as I have proposed to many countries in Europe, 
right now to solve the problem. But that's about the only instance where people would think it makes sense, right, to voluntarily pay. <laughs> we need to figure this out. What is the framework? And it will take a lot of wisdom of ourselves, of the government, of our leaders to figure this out together. That is why I'm asking all the technology companies around the world to adopt the technocratic oath, like a doctor. I hereby pledge to place humanity first over technology in every decision. When they do that, that's when I will trust AI. Because right now I'm seeing them placing monetary streams, of course. It's a battle of money. But ultimately, are we going to live in a world where we have a lot more money? 10% of us, most of us here, probably, will end up there. But everything else is falling apart. What good will that do for our kids? <laughs> to have more money, but no place where you want to live. How are we going to design the future, the good future, like this? People, planet, purpose, prosperity. That's what it all comes down to. That's what we have to teach our students, our participants, and of course our kids, starting from very, very early in school. Because here's the key question. It's no longer about if and how technology can do something, but why it should. We're just at the cusp of this where we're saying technology in principle can do all of these things. We can live to be 150 years old. We can upload our brain to the internet. No longer science fiction, very soon. The question is who and why and what will it do? And in education, we're at the switching point of this, of this exponential curve to figure out what students will learn from this. So five keys to the future of education. First, let's get rid of this thinking. These are machines for crying out loud. They're not human. They sound human. They're amazing simulators. They're doing great on the, on the, on the parrot, you know, stochastic parrot thing. They sound really good, but they don't really know real life. That's like saying when you see a picture of a city or a person, that's the person. Well, everybody knows that's not the case, right? This is a snapshot. A holistic approach to the future. All disciplines, all topics, and looking at the side effects of what technology does. That's called holistic. If we had done that with oil and gas, we wouldn't be here today with climate change. We didn't take the holistic view, we took the easy way out, which was more and more and more and more, and now we're paying the price. So that's something to keep in mind when we think about what education will look like, also protecting what makes us human. Right? Proaction and precaution. That means sometimes you say yes, sometimes you say no. In any case, I don't want to do it. Sometimes you say yes, maybe I'll change my mind tomorrow. This is what humans do. Take a wider view. The future jobs are not even invented yet. 70% of 2030 jobs are not even invented yet today. They don't exist. So it's time for education to become future focused. To think about what's not already here. To develop the agenda that we have there. And finally, to rehumanize. Bring back arts, education, culture, ethics, sports, as Steve Jobs, rest in peace, said from the very beginning, art and technology. That's the ticket. And I think it was very right in this, and I think ultimately this is where we are going to have a good future. And as a summary, I'll leave you with one thought. Your mindset contains your future. I've learned that over the years from speaking to people, if you're an optimist, you will create a future. If you're a pessimist, somebody will create it for you. Your mindset of understanding the future is what creates your reality. And if you have students, you run educational institutions, the mindset of your students is what you teach them, what you give them, what you try to transfer to them. That's why it's so important. Self-fulfilling prophecy. We have negative view of the future, it will be negative. That's our opportunity. The mindset contains our future. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Merci pour votre temps. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. But do we, uh, we have time for a few questions and after that we'll be heading off to our thank you. So Kurt, thank you. Uh, microphones are right there. We'll be taking, I'm told, three questions. Uh, or any commentaries you'd like to add, we ask you to keep your questions short within 30 seconds a minute so we have time to answer. Do we have anybody who would like to take the mic? The microphone is right there at this moment. Don't be shy because I'll ramble on otherwise. Okay. Please. To be clean. Okay. I'm still thinking about the question. <laughs> Use the microphone. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for your presentation. Um, it's amazing. I'm a humanities teacher um, in Cégep, at Quebec, um, and I teach uh, critical thinking. I teach a lot of the things that you talk about. So thank you for putting this to the forefront. I really appreciate it. Uh, what I have a question is, um, in your presentation, you said the technology is kind of like a hammer. It's neutral. The problem is, and you mentioned this in your presentation, is the confluence of infotech, biotech, all that stuff coming together. We've seen it through Facebook. We've seen it through these algorithms that hack our minds, trying to get us to do likes, like you mentioned. My question to you is, you know, how can you see it as a hammer when you know that these corporations are combining these things to make it not like a hammer anymore, to make it something that is essential to our lives? And I guess the, la the second question that's related is the automation. Um, I get it. I understand that you know, that's what we want robots to do. But I'm thinking about the millions of people in Indonesia who are making uh, stuff in factories. I mean, I worked in factories most of my teenage life. Those people are going to lose a job. And I think they're important jobs, too. I need, we need humans making things for us, too, not just robots. So. I guess those are just your questions. Sorry, I didn't want to take too long. <laughs> I answer the second one first. Um, I think it's quite clear that the future does not exist for us outside of the developing countries. You know, we can't take our future and make our future and not look at their future. It's just like climate change. You know, as we're going into the future, Canada or Europe can completely go green. If these guys aren't coming along in India, Indonesia, and China, we're still toast. So that is quite clear because we are already going green in Europe, but if we don't get Africa and everybody else to come along and stop building coal plants, and you know, we're not going to make it for less than five or six degrees warming, which is disaster. Consequence is we have to pay for them to not do what we did. This is what came out of COP27. So we are going to have to help them to make that switch to renewable energy, which means spending money on them going green, which means I may pay a carbon tax in Germany or in Switzerland, and it may end up in Indonesia to create solar energy. And here's the same thing about jobs. In India, from somewhere where I just spoke, lots and lots of jobs are like this. You know, they're, I wouldn't say menial, but they're, you know, commodity jobs and, and simple, very simple jobs. And of course, they're on the forefront of that whole trend towards uh, technology taken over. So in the end, what it will mean is that we have to figure out a global way of solving this problem, of how we can use technological progress to be distributed evenly. The problem is not that we don't have new money or new solutions, it's that it's about distribution of that new money. So taking the benefit of technology, we could use that to create a, a level playing field for everybody, but so far we haven't. Right? The benefit of social media has not gone to the citizen. Well, there, there's some benefit, of course, but generally it's the corporations. Right? Uh, the other thing is the technology companies, the first questions. I think if we're looking at the reality, banking is regulated, telecom is regulated, media is regulated, technology is not. That pretty much answers the question, right? Because, you know, in the end, this is what it is. Too much of a good thing can be a very bad thing. That's about alcohol, cigarettes, smoking, eating. More people die from obesity every year than from hunger. Technology is the same thing. Too much technology can be a very bad thing. And to get that into place, we're going to need to find a way to create frameworks and guardrails. And now, at this very moment, chat GPT and generative AI is the guardrail moment. Where people are saying, you know, I read this morning, 
basically what's happening with AI that all of the information that you put on the internet, myself included, in the last 20 years is used to train the AI to act like a human. In other words, we have trained the machine to become us. Right? So a lot of these things are now under review, and I think there's a big debate about this in Canada as well, to create meaningful guardrails. That's the job, just like we did with nuclear energy. Except one big difference, it doesn't take much to build an AI. It's hard to build a nuclear bomb. So that's why it's urgent. But I want to leave on a positive note. Let's not forget that the ability of AI, for example, to go into the cloud and run a hundred trillion versions of genomes and figure out what causes cancer so that we can invent a new medication or a new editing process with CRISPR to solve cancer? We could never do that without AI. We don't want to get rid of all that good stuff. Right? We want to channel it. And this is why it's so important that we find the compromise. And this is why I think an education is so crucial that we say all that tech is basically good, but we're going to need a lot of human skills to put it in the right place and to put it into perspective with everything else. Thank you. Thank you. Heading off towards our last question right here. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. I'm curious about your quote around AI and machines being morally neutral when they are designed and created by humans who have their own biases that are influenced by systems of racism, sexism, ableism, colonialism. Um, so when we're the architects of that AI, how are those biases not integrated into the, the AI that we create? Yeah, good question. That's actually not what I meant. Of course, all of our bias and everything that we are is inside of this building that we have done, obviously, because the data is inside. But the AI, the technology itself, has no intent. It has no intent to mess with us. It has no intent to give us wrong information. Its only intent is to get the job done. And therein lies the problem. So when you use ChatGPT and you're pushing it for an answer, and you're pushing and pushing, it will make up stuff because you asked so hard. The other day I was looking at the AI asking questions about my own qualifications on AI, and it made up research reports that mentioned me because I was pushing so hard. And I clicked on the link, was no page. So this is interesting, right? So I think this is really what's happening is that technology is now becoming so powerful that it can sort of rep replicate itself. And there we need solutions on this. I think this is really the key to our future, is the wise use. So ultimately, I think this is what we have as humans. Uh, we have purpose, understanding of who we are. And the Greek word telos, which I like a lot, that's wisdom. And that is the ticket to education and jobs in the future. Very difficult for a machine to have purpose and tell us, yeah, because it's difficult for us, very hard to define what it is and how we do it, impossible for a machine. And that's why I think that ultimately, these are great tools, we're going to use them, let's figure out the best possible way forward. Let's not go into the future based on fear. I mean, we in Europe are very good at this. Right? We are fearful and we say, okay, <laughs> we don't want to do this. Americans are the opposite. Anything that's fear, they jump on it because it's opportunity. So we should go into the future with a mix of skepticism and also optimism. Antonio Gramsci, Italian writer and poet, once said that we should have a pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the heart. I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, to finish off, to finish off, Gerd, uh, we have with us right now Peter Devlin, Chair of Board of CI Can, as well as President of Fanshawe College, to uh, say a few words. Gerd, um, I just wanted to, to, on behalf of all of us, uh, say thank you. Merci. Thanks for making us think about the future, a future that will be a good future. Thank you for making us think about the relationship between Perfect. humans and machines humanity and technology, that were driven by technology, but defined by you, by you, humanity, and the role that we have in the college and institute sector to have the courage to be the architects of the future, 
with the humanity, ethics, creativity, and imagination that's in all of our hearts. And so um, you also reinforced to me that I'm an optimist and I look forward to my next career as a nature deficit therapist. Um, I think I have some, some potential there. Um, but Gerd, on behalf of all of us, merci beaucoup, c'était une présentation extraordinaire. Et uh, votre présence ici ajoutait beaucoup de notre con congrès. Merci. Merci beaucoup.